The story I'm going to tell you is true. It's all set down in the history books. But back when all this happened, it wasn't history at all. Just people and the things they did and the things that happened to them. This is the story of Indiana. started back in 1679, almost 200 years after Columbus. The white man hadn't even set foot in these parts. There was nothing built, nothing settled. Only the Indians hunted the land. There were Shawnee, some Wyandotte, and Kickapoo, and all those Miami and Potawatomi, until one day there came a Frenchman, a man named LaSalle. He came down from the north along the Great Lakes, fur trading and exploring, paddled down the St. Joe River, then crossed to the Kankakee. They say LaSalle was the first white man to walk into Indiana. But once the way was found, it wasn't long till more people started coming in. Trading for furs. First thing you know, there were French forts saddling the river. One up on the Maumee, where Fort Wayne is today. Another one up on the Wabash, near Lafayette. And of course, that big one, downstream, had been thin. By 1732, those French were doing so good with their fur trade, the English started looking to cut in. Well, the Englishmen pushed, and the French and Indians shoved. 
Next thing you know, they had themselves a real nasty little war. It seemed like no sooner would they patch things up than the fight would bust loose again. It took more than 30 years of fighting those French and Indian Wars, but by 1763, the Union Jack was flying up every creek, and the Frenchmen had cleared out. Next step was to get some laws into the country. Only thing was, the king, over in England, gave us a few too many and touched off the American Revolution. You'd have felt the same as the settlers if you'd been here. That politician with the French, why, these woods are plum full of Frenchmen, poking around and poaching our furs, bringing their Indians with them, and take those taxes, they're just melting us. We got to run those red coats clean out of the land. Yeah. Trouble was, the English had all the forts, the ones the French built including the big one down to Vincennes. And as long as the British held Vincennes, they had the Indiana country pretty well boxed in. Back there in 1778, Virginia covered quite a parcel of land. Went from the ocean clear out past Indiana. So when a feller named George Rogers Clark went to see the governor of Virginia, he was talking to the right man. And what he had in mind was kicking those redcoats out of the whole Northwest, starting at Kaskaskia and ending at Vincennes. Well, sir, Governor Patrick Henry just wasn't the man to give the British what he figured was ours. So he pulled 1,200 pounds right out of the government treasury, told George Rogers Clark to get, raise an army, and get those redcoats off our land. Well, George Rogers Clark was a man who would get when he was told. Took his men down the Ohio River, lit where Jeffersonville is today. And on July 4th, 1778, Clark and his long knives came out of house. Scared the British so bad they struck their flag at Chaskaskia without firing a shot. And when Clark came knocking at the walls of Vincennes 10 days after, he found the British there had already cleaned out. I'm afraid that wasn't the end of it, though. The word got back to the British governor at Detroit. And old hair buyer Hamilton, that bloodthirsty lobster back, raised 600 troops. Quick marched all the way to Minton. Took it back in December. Wasn't much of a fight, though, with just the small company Clark had left behind. Now, somebody had to get to Clark. Tell him what had happened. So a fur trader named Francis Vigo said he'd go. High tailed out of Vincennes by canoe, paddled 240 miles in the dead of winter, get the news to Clark. And it's a darn good thing he did. You see, those British marched from Detroit before winter really set in. Got there with all the troops they could spare. And Clark knew that come spring, they'd bring in more men. Get enough troops in Vincennes to hold the whole Northwest. If Clark was to snatch Vincennes back, he had to move right now. Come blizzard or cold, the march had to be made. But could Clark raise the men, get them through snow and wilderness and swamp, get them there in shape to fight? And where was he going to get the money to pay his men, the money to buy them supplies? You know that fur trader, Francis Bagel, took the money right out of his own pocket, paid for the troops, the supplies. Took George Clark's note, promising the government to pay him back every dollar, and they set out to raise the men. But when they got all done, found every rifle they could, they've got only 170 men. 170 men to fight 600 British troops. By February 23rd, Clark's ragged little band had made the march all the way to Vincennes, shivering and starving. A march the British were sure couldn't be made. In fact, they were so sure the British commander had snugged himself in for the winter. Figured he was so safe with the weather bad, he'd let his troops go till spring. And when he peeped out that morning, he found himself caught, trying to hold the whole Northwest with just 30 men. Well, that lobster back gave it a try. Held out two nights and a day. But on the morning of the 25th, our flag was flying over Vincent. The British were gone from the Northwest forever. George Rogers Clark had earned himself a place in history.
Oh, it was a great victory. And a lot of folks suffered hardships to win it. But the funny thing is, everybody forgot the man who made it possible. Francis Vigo never did get his money back, like Clark promised he would. Virginia never would pay. And the Congress of the United States turned down every petition. And all those years, Francis Vigo was flat broke, living on charity. Finally, in 1836, 57 years later, Francis Vigo died without enough money to even pay the undertaker. But you know, he never lost faith that the debt would be paid. He left a will saying he knew someday the government would pay him back. And when they do, he said, pay for my funeral. And then buy me a bell to hang in my county, Vigo County. And so it was, two generations later, that an embarrassed United States Congress paid its debt to Francis Vigo's grandchildren. And today, Francis Vigo's bell hangs high over Terre Haute, tolling out the hours in the land he did so much to win. Well, now, once we got that revolution business settled, we started getting things organized. Folks started calling this whole big piece of land the Northwest Territory and running it as sort of a project from over in Virginia. But they said it was just temporary, this long-distance government thing. They promised that when we were ready, they'd give us something we could run here at home. That they'd carve up the Northwest Territory proper into states like Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and of course, Indiana. And they did, too. Started calling us the Indiana Territory. Even drew a line on the map dividing us from Ohio. By 1800, we had a capital town, down to Vincennes, with a territory governor and all. Don't you know who that was? Old William Henry Harrison. Now, William Henry made us a real good first governor, but he had some problems to settle. See, back in 1800, there was only about 5,000 folks in the whole Indiana Territory, but even that was too many for the Indians. They reckoned we were cutting too deep into their hunting land. Well, those settlers were so scattered, it was pretty easy for the Indians to kick up a fuss. And it sure didn't help any when the British started riling up the tribe, sort of boiling the pot. By 1811, the Indian trouble had got pretty fierce. And there was just one thing old William Henry could do, go in and settle them once and for all. He finally cornered a whole army of Indians up on the tip of the canoe. Well, sir, it took some doing, but we whipped them. William Henry was known ever after as old Tip of Canoe. He even got so famous they ran him for president of the whole United States in 1840. Elected him, too. Anyhow, after the Indians got quieted down, folks started pouring into the Indiana Territory by the thousands, taking out claims to the land. They started moving up from towns along the Ohio, like Parksville, and Madison, and New Albany. And before long, there were new towns everywhere popping up like freckles on a redhead in the spring. Places like Evansville, Bloomington, Terre Haute, and Indianapolis. In the next 10 years, our 5,000 settlers had increased five times to 25,000 folks. And they were still swarming up the rivers and across the hills. Pretty soon, there were so many settlers, we figured it was time we had a capital of our own right here in Indiana. And in 1813, we got around to staking it out place up from Louisville, it was, off the river, a place called Corrigan. Right away, everybody started getting itchy about getting to be a state. Well, Congress hemmed and hawed around a little at first. But finally, in 1816, they said, go on, have a meeting over at Corrigan. Figure out a constitution for being a state. And when you're finished arguing, write it all up and send it back east. We'll look it over and see about making you a proper state. Well, they sure were right about the argument. The only mercy was that most of the folks were farmers and the month was June. They had to quit join after only 19 days so they could get back to the field. But they got it all down on paper before they left. And before Christmas, it was done. Official. December 11, 1816. Indiana joined the Union right. 
flag of the United States got its 19th star. Indiana was a state. to be a mighty popular shopping place for people who'd headed west. You can imagine what it was like. No railroads, no old established towns. It was just wilderness trails and bring your own plow. And keep an eye out for Indians or you'd lose your cow for sure. In fact, about all any man had to rely on in those days, besides his axe and his rifle, was his stock and his neighbors. The new Indiana country was drawing all kinds of people from all kinds of places. A lot of them were farmers, of course, and a few of them craftsmen. But most of them were just plain folk, with a little furniture and a lot of hope, and a dream about making a new life in a new land. Now, I'd like to tell you about a couple of those folks. Came to southern Indiana about the same time, 1815, 1816. Settled down just 50 miles from each other. Well, sir, they sure thought different, lived different, and they never even met face to face. But the important thing is, I guess, they both sure left their mark in this world. The first was a fellow named George Rapp. Father Rapp, they called him. And he believed that the way to get into heaven was for people to live together in a place where everyone was equal and everything belonged to everybody. Now, that idea wasn't too popular over in Germany, where Rapp lived. So in 1805, Rapp and some others came to America, where a man could live and believe the way he wanted. And by 1814, the Rappites had grown so much, they ran out of room. Decided to come out to Indiana. Settled down on the Wabash River in Posey County, about 22 miles northwest of where Evansville is today. There, the Rappites cleared the land and built a town with big buildings that are still standing today. Planted vineyards and fields. And they called it Harmony. Everybody worked hard all the time. And by 1823, folks in Harmony were pretty well fixed. Everybody had plenty to eat, clothes to wear, they had houses, livestock, land. But it was a funny thing. Nobody ever laughed in Harmony. Pretty soon they got to feeling restless, discontent. And by 1825, Father Rapp's dream of a perfect town where nobody ever went without, well, that dream was fading. In those 10 years, Harmony had grown healthy on the outside, all right, but it was mighty sick at heart. Well, sir, Father Rapp decided the only thing to do was sell, offer up the whole 30,000 acres that belonged to the people of Harmony, the land, the buildings, and the equipment and all, and move on. Now, over there in England was a young man named Robert Owen. And he made quite a name for himself, working from dawn to night to make a better life for the working folk. He believed every man should be equal, just like Father Rapp did. But the difference was, Owen thought folks could solve all their problems if they'd work together for each other, make the things all the people needed so none went without. Well, when he found out Harmony was for sale, Owen thought it would be just the place to try his ideas, so he bought it. Paid $150,000 for the whole thing. And then he invited anyone in the whole world who thought like him to come live in New Harmony. By Christmas of 1825, almost 1,000 folks from all over everywhere moved into the houses and buildings the Rappites left behind. And right away, Robert Owen wanted to get his perfect town started out right. And that meant education. If there was anything Robert Owen believed in, it was education. So he headed straight back to England, gathered up the smartest men he could find, teachers and scientists and artists and writers, people who could educate the Owenites in New Harmony. He brought them back and put them on a special keel boat at Pittsburgh, called it the Boatload of Knowledge, ran it down the Ohio and up the Wabash to New Harmony by January 26, 1826. Well, what the Rappites started, the Owenites tried to finish. But Robert Owen's government was so easygoing, 
It just kind of fell apart. Why, it wasn't more than a year later when Owen Sons announced to the world that the perfect town had failed. But whatever else you hear, some pretty fine things got done at New Harmony, and a lot of these ideas live on in our lives. Why, they started the first kindergarten in the United States. Had a complete school, free for all children. Had classes for grown people, too. And one of the first traveling libraries. They said women ought to be equal with men. And that was really something back then. The first woman's club to look after women's rights was there in New Harmony. And most important of all, the folks of New Harmony believed all men should be free, including the slaves. Some years later, one of these New Harmony people was going to have quite a say about slavery and say it to that other settler I was telling you about, a man named Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abe was just a boy of seven when the Lincolns came to Indiana. Crossed the Ohio River in December 1816, the same month we got to be a state. Fifty miles away, the Rappites had been building their town for a year. But for the Lincolns and most of the other settlers in Indiana, even the walking was tough. It took Tom Lincoln two whole days to fight through the 16 miles of brush between the river and his plot of land on the banks of Pigeon Creek near Gentryville. When they got there, they found out they didn't have any neighbors to help build cabins. So for that first winter, the family had to make do in a rough lean-to with only a fire on the open side to keep out the cold. And with no crop in, they had to hunt game if they were going to eat at all. Well, it was a cold and discouraging start, but it was home to the Lincoln. The next summer, they built a rough log cabin, and there they lived for the next 14 years until Abe was a man of 21. It's hard to believe that the town of Harmony was prospering just 50 miles away with buildings and stock and crops and plenty of hands to do the work. While the Lincolns and other settlers faced hardship and starvation almost every day. Abe's cousin, Dennis Hank, said, Folks here are living the same as Indians, except for an interest in politics and religion. Those cabins were mighty drafty and bare. Usually a woman had just one pot to cook in big iron skillet, and what she cooked mostly was corn pone, wild berries, or milk and mud, maybe some turnips or potatoes, and whatever wild game or fish or men folk could bring home. Children had to stand up at the table because folks thought it would strengthen their legs, and almost nobody went to school. Abe Lincoln spent less than a year inside a schoolroom in his whole life. He had to learn everything he could by himself, from the five books his family had and the few he could borrow from the neighbors. In fact, these Indiana settlers had all they could do just to keep from starving. But sometimes the work would turn into fun, especially at a husking bee or a house raising. While the men would work, the boys would run foot races or square off a wrestling matches. And the women would sit and quilt and talk about things like the best time to plant corn or how to make yard tea to cure about any sickness. All that hardship gave some folks notions that sound pretty strange to us today. They used to say a bird flying past a window meant bad crops, and a girl who sat on a table would never get a husband. If you killed a toad, they said you, your cow would give bad milk. And if you had freckles, you'd get rid of them by washing with stump water on the first day of May before the sun came up. Well, those may have been rough years, all right. But out of all that struggle came a way of life. Folks who were used to fighting for what they got and what they believed was right. So once they had the country tamed, some of these folks went right on making their mark and wound up in the history books. Old Tippecanoe, William Henry Harrison, got to be president. Young Abe Lincoln went to Illinois and got himself into politics. And a good-talking young man from New Harmony started making speeches in the state legislature that made people sit up and listen. That was Robert Dale Owen, son of the man who'd founded New Harmony. Next thing anyone knew, young Owen was in the United States Congress. Now, he was a man who learned the value of knowledge and history from his years at New Harmony. So while he was there in Washington, he got us a bill that built the Smithsonian Institution so we'd have a place to keep forever the historical treasures of our nation. And that wasn't the last heard of young Bob Owen. Back in the new state capitol, they were saying we needed a new state constitution. 
We'd outgrown the old one, just like we'd outgrown the old capital town at Corridor. And when we'd got ready to build at Indianapolis, we called in the same architect fella that laid out Washington, D.C. Now we were ready to call in the best men we could find to lay us out a new state constitution. Well, if you think they argued the summer of 1816, you should have heard of in 51. Seems we'd left out quite a bit in our first constitution, and folks didn't aim to overlook a thing this time. Well, young Bob Owen wanted one thing for sure, so he got to his feet and talked a blue streak until everyone just gave up. And now we have a part in our Indiana Constitution that guarantees every boy and girl will have a good school education for free. Well, the years went skipping by, and the state was growing faster than anyone could believe. By 1860, we had more than one and a quarter million people in Indiana. Good farms dotted the countryside. Our cities were healthy and gainful. But there was a smell of war in the air. And before we knew it, the Civil War was on. Those were times when men were searching their hearts, thinking out for themselves what was right on the question of slavery. And the man who had it hardest of all was the president, Abe Lincoln. I guess he had advice from every living soul in Washington and letters from half the population. One thing about President Lincoln, though, he was a man who would listen. Well, the war wasn't really so old in 1862 when Robert Dale Owen, from New Harmony, sat down to write to the president. Wrote him a real scorcher, pouring out his heart about free and the slave. In a way, it's funny these two men who lived not 50 miles from each other in the Indiana wilderness would hook minds again so much later on, and that they'd agree so well. But Owen's letter covered a full nine pages in his best copper plate handwriting, and he said a lot of things. But the part I liked best was, It is within your power at this very moment not only to consummate an act of enlightened statesmanship, but as the instrument of the Almighty to restore to freedom a race of man. What a day, if you but will it. A day to be remembered, not in our land alone, but wherever humanity mourns over the wrongs of the slave or rejoices in his liberation. Well, you all know what happened after that. President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and freed the slaves forever. And after it was done, Bob Owen got a letter from the Secretary of the Treasury, Sam Chase, who'd been so close to the president during all the hard time of deciding what to do. And I guess the man from New Harmony trembled a little when he read what that letter said. It will be a satisfaction to you to know that your letter to the president had more influence on him than any of the other documents that reached him on the subject. I think I might say more than all the others put together. And that, right there, is a fitting tribute to the dream that built New Harmony. in this tough young country, there's always been a price. And the price we paid for the Civil War was the most terrible one of all. Oh, it didn't seem so bad at first, with the bands playing and the young men in bright blue uniforms marching off. But later, when the newspapers printed the long list of the dead and wounded, and the broken bodies came back in, people began to see what an awful price it was. At Indianapolis, there was one man in particular, a Dr. Richard Gatling. He was a medical doctor by profession, but he used to invent things in his spare time. And he really cared about the war. He'd go down to the railroad depot when the soldiers went off to war, and he'd be there when they came back, too. A well-dressed man in his 40s, just walking slowly between those rows of wooden boxes some had come home in, wishing there was a way to end the whole ugly thing, wondering how these boys met their end. Then, one day, Doc Gatlin felt he had to look inside those boxes 
and discovered that only four of the 18 soldiers he saw there had died from bullets. The rest were dead from diseases that they might just as well have got staying home. And that made the price seem even worse. Well, that very night, the doc went to work on a new invention. The trouble, he decided, was that those old-fashioned rifles were doing such a bad job that the war was just being stretched out. What he had in mind was a weapon that would let one soldier do the work of 100, a weapon that would make war so terrible and death so sure for the enemy that it'd do away with war forever. Well, sir, within a year, Doc Gatlin and his machinists had made themselves a gun, a terrible weapon that would fire not the 100 bullets a minute he had figured on, but 250 a minute, every minute a man turned the crank, and they called it the Gatlin gun. And it was just as terrible as Doc Gatlin predicted. Though it didn't get into the war until near the end, the Gatlin gun did help end the fight, and then went west to help fight the Indians. Oh, there wasn't anything wrong with the Doc's idea. It was just that men are so mule-headed. Doc Gatlin and his gun didn't end wars, and the rest of his life he was sorry. Because Doc Gatlin was a peaceable man, a man who'd rather be remembered as a man who invented the Gatlin drill to save wheat seed from the frost. Well, the Civil War was a terrible one, and plenty of Hoosier boys died helping to save the Union. But in a way, we were kind of lucky. There was a pretty fierce battle at Corridon, but there was never very much real fighting on Indiana soil. In fact, the most famous battle in Indiana wasn't a battle at all. It was 1863, and General John Hunt Morgan and his Confederate raiders were riding through the south of Indiana, burning bridges and terrorizing the livestock. On July 11th, he came to Vernon, over in Jennings County, and found the home guard waiting for him. Right away, Morgan called for the town to surrender, like most of the other towns he'd captured. But those Vernon guardsmen were feisty. No, sir, they said. You let us get the women and children out of danger, and we'll give you a fight you'll remember. Now, Morgan knew there was a big Union army just a few hours behind him, and he figured he needed to move on a lot more than he needed to take Vernon. So he said that was fine with him and made a little noise so it'd sound like he was out there waiting. Well, by the time it got dark, those Vernon boys were ready, lined up on the banks of Finney's Ford, a creek that runs by the town, listening for the first sound of the attack. Then, all of a sudden, there was a splashing sound in the ford. The home guard opened fire, but the splashing got louder. Sounded like a thousand men. A lieutenant shouted, charge! And the whole Vernon home guard did. Trouble was, they forgot about the 20-foot bank up above the ford. And just like cattle in a loading chute, the whole Vernon home guard ran right off the cliff and fell into the water. And all the time, those guardsmen were thrashing around in Finney's ford. Morgan and his raiders were miles away. Sneaked off while the town was being evacuated. That noise they heard was just a farmer driving his livestock across the creek to town. Once the Civil War was over, we really started growing. In fact, the whole country was opening up, and Indiana was boiling with people and buildings. The river was full of steamboats, carrying cargo between the factories in the east and the settlers in the west. And then the railroads came tracking across the land, moving things even faster. In fact, it was a real question if the river traffic could keep up with the rails. Speed was such a thing. Well, down at New Albany, along the Ohio, were some shipyards that had got to be pretty famous for building speed into a boat. So when Captain John Cannon showed up one day in 1866, they weren't too surprised. It was natural that the man who claimed to be the greatest riverboat captain in the world would come to New Albany. Well, sir, Captain Cannon jammed that gold-headed cane of his in the mud and drew a picture of what he wanted, right there on the riverbank. In no time, the New Albany boys were sawing and hammering. A whopping $230,000 worth of steamboat, the fastest one ever designed. And they called it the Robert E. Lee. Captain Cannon was real proud of that boat. He got to bragging about it all up and down the Mississippi. Finally, one fella, Captain Tom Leathers, got pretty tired of hearing it. So he borrowed $200,000 and stomped over to Cincinnati ordered the fastest steamboat that money could buy. He called his the Natchez. And when it was done, it made the trip down from St. Louis in a new record time. Three days, 22 hours, and 45 minutes. Well, sir, nobody knows for sure who challenged who, 
But on the 1st of July, 1870, both these big steam palaces were tied up there in New Orleans, ready to go. Race from New Orleans to St. Louis, a thousand miles or more of twisting channel and shifting sandbars to find out once and for all who was the fastest on the river. They say it was the greatest steamboat race in the history of the river, and the bank was lined with boats cheering for their fate. But that boat from Indiana, the Robert E. Lee, never let go of the lead. And on the 4th of July, she came steaming into St. Louis, bearing a brand new record. New Orleans to St. Louis in three days, 18 hours, and 14 minutes. Well, sir, in spite of all that speed on the rivers, the railroads grew even faster in those years after the Civil War. Before long, the cinders and sparks and roar of the trains overtook the whole wonderful world of riverboat men. The big boat building yards were empty and still. And the railroad, at first just tolerated as a fool notion, became a giant linked forever with the rise of the Indiana you and I know. Now, down in Jackson County, a group of men were watching the growth of the railroad with special interest. They were the dangerous and daring band of thieves known as the Reno Gang. Now, there are lots of stories about the Reno boys and their friends, but the folks who wrote the Jackson County history book back in 1886 told it this way. There were five boys in the Reno family, grew up on a farm down near Seymour. One of them, Clint, they called him, was a good law-abiding citizen. But the other four, John, Simon, William, and Frank, were just plain thieves. Frank, the oldest, was the leader. And he had some pretty strange ideas. For one thing, he just didn't think it was fair for some folks to be rich while others were poor. So he figured he'd just steal from the rich ones and give it to the poor. Of course, the poor he had in mind included himself mostly. Before long, the Reno gang included a long list of dangerous criminals. They rode all over the countryside, robbing banks, breaking into stores, stealing money wherever they could find it. Once in a while, a few of them got caught. But they always seemed to make some daring escape and turn up back where they started, stealing and terrorizing like before. Well, sir, it seemed like there wasn't a jail could hold them, and Frank Reno was getting pretty cocky. He figured it was time to try something really big. By now, the railroads were laying tracks all over Indiana, and trains were the most important way to get things back and forth between the east and frontier. Frank knew those trains carried a lot of money, too. So he decided to go after the biggest prize of all. He'd rob a train for the first time in history. It was a cold December day in 1867 when the Reno gang stopped that first train just east of Seymour, and they made off with two express cars safe and more than $45,000. Well, that was just about the biggest robbery folks in these parts had ever heard of, and they were pretty mad. So they formed a vigilante committee and went after the Reno boys. Only one they could catch up with, though, was John Reno, one of the younger brothers, caught him not far from Seymour and decided to hang him right there, tied a rope around his neck and left him hanging from a tree. But somehow he managed to get loose, and before long he was back with the rest of the gang. You know, there's something about crooks makes them think if they got away with something once, they can do it again. So on May 22nd, 1868, the Reno gang stopped another train, this time at Marshfield, south of Seymour, and they took away $90,000 in government securities and gold. Success only made the Reno boys more greedy, and less than two months later, on July 10th, they tried for the third time. But this time, the railroad was ready for them. The train was full of detectives, led by a man named Major Alan Pinkerton. John Reno was captured in the battle, and within a few hours, the rest of the gang were under arrest, too, locked up in the new Albany jail. But before they could be brought to trial, a crowd of angry citizens stormed the jail and hanged six of the gang right there in the courthouse. Those were rough days, all right. And some places, it took a little longer for law and order to get established. But not even the Reno gang had stopped the train from coming or keep Indiana from growing. And all those good folks who had to cut their way into this country just a few years before, the farmers and the craftsmen and the dreamers, well, they just kept on building. Built towns and farms and a good way of life. And they made Indiana what it is today.
was pretty good by now. The farms were prosperous, the towns were healthy, and there were a lot of folks who said things just couldn't be better. Progress had gone about as far as it could go. But one young man in Portland, Indiana, named Elwood Haynes, wasn't satisfied. Now, Elwood Haynes was a bright young man. He'd invented a new way of making oxygen when he was just 15 years old. He built a furnace and blower that could melt brass and cast iron, even high carbon steel. In fact, he was so smart that by the time he was 26, they made him the principal of the Portland High School. But deep down inside, Elwood Haynes was an inventor and doer. Education couldn't hold him. In 1890, Elwood Haynes became a field superintendent for the Indiana National Gas and Oil Company, building a gas pipeline between Greentown, Indiana, and Chicago. Day after day, Haynes drove his horse and buggy all the way from Greentown to the construction site. And day after day, it was a long, tiresome journey for the horse and the driver. One day, Haynes got to thinking. The trouble with a horse, he said, is it gets tired. What if you could figure a way to do without a horse? What if you could build a horseless carriage that can run on its own power? In 1892, Haynes moved to Kokomo. And by the summer of 93, he was ready. He bought a one-horsepower, two-cycle gasoline engine from a place up in Michigan and started building a car around it in his kitchen. Almost a year later, it was finished. The 4th of July, 1894. The first successful automobile ever built in America was ready to run. Oh, you should have been there that day when they started up that car for the first time. Haynes himself told it this way. The moment the car appeared, a crowd gathered forming a circle not over 20 feet in circumference. I deemed it unwise to start the machine under these conditions, as none of us had ever seen a machine of that sort, much less operated one. It therefore was attached to the rear of a horse carriage and hauled about three miles into the country where a start was made. Well, sir, here they came flying down pumpkin vine pike at an incredible seven miles an hour, all the way into Kokomo without making a single stop. The era of the automobile in America was born. Pretty soon, Indiana was the car capital of the world, and it stayed that way for a lot of years. The big names like the Haynes, Apperson, Marmon, the Duesenberg, Auburn, and Cord, they were all built right here in Indiana. Today, if you go to Washington, to the Smithsonian, you can find that first successful automobile this country ever saw. Yes, sir, it's Elwood Haynes' horseless carriage, built in a kitchen in Kokomo, Indiana. Well, time passed, and the automobile had just about lost its novelty. I mean, most everybody had at least seen one, when something even better came along. The folks in Indiana discovered a horse. Now, I don't mean just any old horse. I'm talking about the most special horse anyone around here ever saw. A stubby legged pacer named Dan Peck. Oh, they'd expected big things from Dan even before his mama saw him. After all, he was the son of Joe Patchett, quite a pacer in his own right. Came within a blink of the two minute mile a time or two. So the day Dan came into this world, on a farm up near Oxford, Indiana. Folks who knew horses were mighty glad to see him. Back then, nobody ever raced a horse as a youngster, like they do now. At least, no more than they had to, to keep him good and healthy. So Dan Patch was five years old before he set foot on the Grand Circuit. He stepped right along, too. Only thing was, he was such a shrimp. And people were saying he'd never really be great. Even when Dan had paced a mile down around the two-minute time, folks would still shrug. A lot of horses could do that, they said. Well, that first season on the circuit, the little fellow did pretty well. And by July of 1902, his second year, he'd won 56 races, lost only two. That's when a man named M.W. Savage decided this was the horse he'd been waiting for. In fact, he wanted him so bad, he upped and paid a crazy $60,000 for little Dan Pat. Savage, you're crazy. No pacer in the world's worth that much money. You're all show, Savage. Who are you trying to kid? That little horse never will be great. And he'll never hit two minutes. 
Savage just grinned and went about his business. He was rich and he was shrewd, and he knew a great harness horse when he saw one. Besides, tough old M.W. Savage just plain loved that little horse. Well, sir, that's when things really started happening. Race after race, Dan's time skidded downward toward that magic two-minute flat. Dan Patch was on his way. The winner, Dan Patch. Time, two minutes flat. Winner, Dan Patch. In the time, 1.59. Dan Patch. Dan Patch in a world record time, 157 and a half. Two years later, Dan had it all. He was a pacing legend, and in his own time. Every time Dan Patch ran, attendance records would fall. By the time he hit the Minnesota State Fair in September of 1906, Dan Patch was drawing people from 100 miles around. Came to watch him pace for less than two minutes. As they stepped out on the track that day, the driver, Harry Hershey, looked at all the water sloshing in the sulky track and shook his head. Too soft to be fast today, he decided. But Dan Patch had other ideas. He was ready to move. At the first quarter, the old-timers stood up straight around the rail and wondered. At the half, they knew. And by the third quarter, every one of those thousands of the bleachers were on their feet and screaming. Straight into the stretch came little Dan Patch, the sun shining on that mahogany bay coat and the soft track churning under those hobble legs, graceful as a flying feather, Head bolt upright, Dan Patch was writing history with every stride. One fifty-five flat. Well, the years have been flying by faster than most folks could realize. Life was good in Indiana, and getting better all the time. Indiana was in a new century. The Indians all had gone. Steamboats were done. And a horse like Dan Patch comes just once every couple hundred years. People started looking around and seeing all that progress. And you know what? Sometimes it makes them a little sad. Of course, when folks get older, they get to thinking back about when they were youngsters and life seemed simpler. And they like to reach out and touch those magic years again, just for a little while. Sometimes a man comes and helps. A man who understands those memories and knows how to recall them just right. A man who writes them all down, maybe for himself, maybe for everybody else. But that's the way it was with one of the men we knew in Indiana. A man named James Whitcomb Riley. He'd help us remember. Oh, the old swimming hole, where the creek so still and deep looked like a baby river that was laying half asleep. And the gurgle of the water around the drift just below sounded like the lap of something we once used to know before we could remember anything but the eyes of the angel looking out as we left paradise. But the merry days of youth is beyond our control, and it's hard to part forever with the old swimming hole. Where James Whitcomb Riley grew up, around Greenfield, life was good. And it showed in everything he wrote. A thousand poems aboard. And especially when he wrote about people. Well, the raggedy man, he worked for Pa. And he's the goodest man ever you saw. He comes to our house every day and waters the horses and feeds them hay. And he opens the shed and we all just laugh when he drives out our little old wobbly cat. And then if a hired girl says he can, he milks the cow for Elizabeth Ann. Ain't he an awful good raggedy man? Raggedy, raggedy, raggedy man. Yes, those good old days really were good. And if you kept an eye open and a memory clear for all the good things you saw around you, you could bring them back whenever you wanted. And if your memory got a little fuzzy sometimes, you could always pick up a book of Riley's poems and drink up the words as he poured them out. When the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock, and you hear the chuck and gobble of the stuttin' turkey cock, and the clackin' of the guineas and the cluckin' of the hens, 
and the rooster, hallelujah, as he tiptoes on the fence. Oh, he bends at times a fellow is a feeling at his best with the rising sun to greet him from a night of peaceful rest. As he leaves the house bareheaded and goes out to feed the stock, when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder is in the shop. Remember? The husky, rusty rustle of the tossels of the corn and the rasping of the tangled leaves as golden as the morn. The stubble and the furrows, kind of lonesome light, but still, a preaching sermon stirs for the barns they go to fill. The straw stacks in the meadow, the reaper in the shed, the horses in their stalls below, and the clover overhead. Oh, it sets my heart a clicking like the ticking of a clock when the frost is on the pumpkin and the father's in the shop. We'll remember, Mr. Riley, as long as there are red apples to eat and corn to grow, as long as there are children to play and old folks to remember. You will always help us remember, Indiana, the way it used to be. We're much obliged, Mr. Riley. Much obliged.